great. I hope so. The woman I with the music was she great. Yeah. Welcome, Penny. <laughs> Thank you all for being here at this wonderful home for live poetry. The hair from my brush. I am saving the hair that I pull from my brush to give to a robin this spring. I picture her knowing why I've left it in the driveway. I picture her knowing it will make her nest softer. I see her busy in a bush by my kitchen, weaving my long silver strands in and out. Now I see the day we watch the eggs crack open. Now I see her back and forth for all that feeding. And me, now part of the launch pad they'll all be taking off from. Am I getting ready to be just part of everything? Am I getting ready to be no longer me? Um, if, that, if that was about starting to let go of a, an identity constructed over a lifetime, then this next one is about constructing that identity. It's called What I'm Proud Of. When I searched for my birth family, I found 10 or 11 generations of ancestors, including real pilgrims, capital P, and revolutionary, capital R, soldiers. And my farthest back known female ancestor, Rachel Bouton, whose name means black button and someone who founded the farthest west chapter of the Daughters of the Confederacy, and someone in the Arkansas legislature when they voted to become a state, and Michael from Monaghan who fought for the Union and settled in a sod house, and a doctor whose heart was broken by a land scam, and a superintendent of schools who almost died when his grandson was kicked out of school for drilling a hole between the boys' and girls' bathrooms. <laughs> and someone beheaded by a buggy when he stuck his head out of a manhole. And the president of the DAR for the state of South Dakota. And so on. But I want you to know I'm not bragging about these ancestors. I've done nothing to deserve them or not. And I might have liked these people and they might have liked me or not. I'm bragging about not going through my life not knowing about these ancestors. That I got out from under the shame of being a bastard got out from under the fear of my parents feeling abandoned, got out from under my fear of maybe not finding anybody, got out from under, um, got out from under the law that withholds my, still holds my original identity from me, that I got out from under all that is what I'm proud of. I think of this as my California poem, but that's not what the title is. The title is Across and Down for two reasons. One is that it's about geography, so it's across the San Francisco Bay and down the peninsula. And then I wrote it so that I'm reading it across each line and then down each of three columns. And it was very fun to try to make it at least make a little sense going down, like it should make sense, of course, going across. And it kind of does. Across and down. Amy and I went over the bay to hear her at Berkeley. 
Adoptees to hear another adoptee. Poets to hear a prize-winning poet. Women to hear a woman read between two men. The alumna poet down from UC Davis between the student poet and the faculty famous writer. What struck me is what she said before one poem. This was after the Loma Prieta earthquake of 89, when she hadn't known which set of parents to call first. With her birth parents at their home in Palo Alto, and the, other, and the adoptive ones farther down in San Jose. I say we have a poem here with all four parents not far from the fault line, but the adoptee having made it back and forth over the split template back up near the old mother load with its rowdy river scenes of desperate hope, plodding work, finding gold. Now, <laughs> this is, that was the across, this is the down. Same words, different order. Amy and I, adoptees, poets, women, the alumna between the student poet, what struck me, this was after, when she hadn't known, with her birth parents and the adoptive ones, I say with all four, but the adoptee over the mother load, desperate hope. Went over the bay to hear, to hear, to hear a woman read, poet down from, and the faculty is what she said, the Loma Prieta, which set of parents in their, at their home farther down. We have parents not far having made it split template with its rowdy, plodding work. To hear her at Berkeley, another adoptee, a prize-winning poet. Between two men, UC Davis, famous writer. Before one poem, Earthquake of 89, to call first in Palo Alto, in San Jose. A poem here, from the fault line, back and forth, back up near the old river scenes of finding gold. <laughs> when, when I read that, I am back in California where I was born and grew up. And um, in this next poem, I wrote it to put myself into history. Uh, it's called Entering History. And it starts with an epigraph from A.S. Bayad, British poet. And um, I'm going to read this quote, which I love twice, from A.S. Bayad. The older I get, the more I habitually think of my own life as a relatively short episode in a long history of which it is a part. The older I get, the more I habitually think of my own life as a relatively short episode in a long history of which it is a part. So one long story I'm part of is the Irish diaspora. Each of my four parents, a mix of Irish and English. The, the colonized, the colonizers, the Catholics, the Protestants. My two mothers partly from neighboring counties. But how did I start to feel part of it? On my first trip to Ireland, a tour bus took us past the president's house in Phoenix Park. There's a light like a porch light that's always kept on there. The first woman president of Ireland remembered the ones who had left, who'd had to, whom Ireland couldn't feed, and their descendants. She thought of us as part of them and left the light on. 
Oh, Mary Teresa Winifred Burke Robinson, born the year I was, thank you for that gentle gesture. I was, I did, I felt welcomed back. So my birth father was the guy who drilled the hole between the boys and the girls' <laughs> bathrooms. And he, in his marriage, had one child. Um, and my brother and I met when he was in his 50s and I was in my 30s. And we had both grown up as only children, so I think he was just as thrilled to have a sibling as I was. And, um, this is called memory. My brother loans me a tape for improving memory. Somewhere under this gurgling water, subliminal messages. But what will they help me remember? Someone I haven't thought of in years? Something I promised to do and haven't? That day in that other world when the bottle fell from the fridge onto my mother's toe? Will I remember everything we need at the store to relax my shoulders? The poems I hope to memorize? What I decided we are here for? I need no help remembering the first thing my brother ever said to me. This is Bill Duckett from Hope, Arkansas, and I never knew I had a sister, but I love you. Um, so anyone here um, besides me who likes to do jigsaw puzzles? Huh? So you might identify with some of this. What happens when I do a puzzle? I tell myself I'm clearing my mind for other things, that it's helping me slow down or could speed me up if I want, ready to go. I tell myself improving my eye-hand coordination or it's a meditation or maybe like heroin, zing, but over so soon. I tell myself this teaches me a painting by Van Gogh from inside the painting. That I'm honoring my mother, or maybe just having her with me. Do I reenact some puzzle of my childhood? Am I, keeping some, uh, am I hoping that something will fall into place and make sense? I tell myself I'm learning to walk away when you can't solve a problem. You know you will notice new things when you come back. I tell myself this might be mere play, but that grown-ups go to workshops, pay money to learn how to play, to feel more alive. And as, and as for alive, I wonder if it isn't erotic just to fit things together, the protruding, the enclosing. Maybe just the magic of holding things together by finding their connections, like when I fit together some words for a poem. <laughs> and my last poem, I am reading to you to remind us all of how poetry can sometimes be unexpected unexpectedly powerful or magical in terms of what it can make happen. And after I read this poem, I'm going to show you what this poem made happen. This is called, I Want Joyce to Make a Painting. Five women here, two black, three white. I want Joyce to make a painting. The only female state senators in South Carolina. I want Joyce to make a painting. Each of them filibustered for more than four hours to stop the banning of most abortions. Three Republicans, one Democrat, one Independent, not that party matters here. All have chosen to be mothers, but when and with whom 
and they want that for their daughters. You see the energy in their hands, their large and strong and capable hands. I know Joyce could put this in a painting, that it's in their hands. So I sent my friend Joyce Cajano the poem and a little fuzzy clipping, and this is what she made of it. Thank you. Thank you.